Good afternoon to you all. And really, I welcome you all to this conversation with Secretary Madeleine Albright, mostly class of 59, and Ms. Susanna Malcora, moderated by Carol Giacomo. And the title of today's talk is Responsible Global Leadership and a Path to Rebuilding Global Institutions. Um, obviously, this is a timely topic, and we cannot be more thrilled to have our guest with us at the Albright Institute today. So without any more delay, I want to turn it over to President Johnson. President Johnson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Stacy, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I just want to welcome you and thank all of you for joining today's Albright Institute's public dialogue, Responsible Global Leadership, and a path to rebuilding global institutions. And I know that it's going to be memorable, a memorable and thought-provoking conversation. For over a decade now, the Albright Institute has engaged students in understanding and addressing the most urgent issues of our time. And they've done this through a dynamic interdisciplinary approach. And central to its mission and to Wellesley's mission is the belief that the surest way to bring positive change to the world is by educating and empowering women to be leaders. I'd like to begin by thanking the individuals who helped make the fellows experience and this Institute's winter session so successful. I wanna begin with a special thank you to Secretary Albright. And I speak for the entire college when I say that our admiration and our gratitude to you is immense and that we are always so amazingly honored to have you return to Wellesley, even if it's by Zoom. Uh, Professor Stacy Goddard, uh, we are so fortunate to have you as our faculty director of the Institute, and I'm grateful to you and Rebecca Gordon and the entire Albright team who've really put together such a rigorous and expansive winter session this year under such difficult and unique conditions. Um, I also want to welcome and thank our Albright ambassadors, trustees, and former and emerita trustees, and the world-class roster of Albright faculty um, uh, who have joined us. And I want to give a special welcome to President Emerita, uh, Diana Chapman Walsh, who along with Secretary Albright really birthed the Albright Institute. I hope we've done you proud. Thank you for all that you do for all of you for the Albright Institute, a center for global leadership. And lastly, I do want to welcome our fellows uh, who are here with us. And I hope your experience over the past three weeks has both been challenging and inspiring. I know it has been uh, just listening to you present. Um, it has really been quite remarkable and it's a joy to hear what you've learned. Um, we will, um, you know, I just want to say that some of the most pressing issues that we currently face um, are global issues and they're common to all of humanity uh, and can really only be lastingly reduced by global cooperation and action. And as President Barack Obama so clearly said uh, in his recently published memoir, A Promised Land, and I quote, in the relentless march toward an interconnected world, one in which peoples and cultures can't help but collide, we will learn to live together cooperate with one another and recognize the dignity of others or we will perish. Simply put, the stakes could not be higher. Um, and it is very clear that we must leverage global institutions in order to move forward. So with that said, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. Um, Dean Susanna Malcora, is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Worship of the Argentine Republic. After her resignation in July of 2017, she served as Minister Advisor to the President and went on to serve in that capacity as the chairperson of the WTO Ministerial Conference hosted by Argentina in December of 2017. Before her service in the Argentine government, Ms. Malcora spent more than 11 years in the United Nations, where she joined in 2004 as an Assistant Secretary General and Chief Operating Officer of the World Food Program. 
In May 2008, United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon appointed Ms. Malkora to the position of Under Secretary General for the recently created Department of Field Support, where she was charged with providing logistical, communications, personnel, and financial support services to peacekeeping operations around the globe. And in April of 2012, Ms. Malkora was appointed by the Secretary General to be his Chief of Staff, where she served through 2015. During her time in the United Nations, Ms. Melkora helped to coordinate the mission on the elimination of Syrian chemical weapons and the first health mission for Ebola emergency response in West Africa. Prior to her roles in public service, Ms. Melkora spent almost 25 years in the private sector, beginning as a systems engineer at IBM and retiring in 2002 as CEO of Telecom Argentina. This past spring, Ms. Malcora became Dean of the IE School of Global and Public Affairs. She's currently a member of the External Advisors Group for the President of the General Assembly and part of the Executive Councils of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and the Atlantic Council in the Inter-American Dialogue and the Aspen Ministers Forum. Dean Malcora, we are so delighted and honored that you have joined us to take part in the Institute and in today's conversation. Welcome. Former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, Wellesley class of 59, is one of the leading figures of her generation. She was the first woman to become Secretary of State, the highest ranking woman in the history of the US government when she was confirmed in that role in 1997. Her distinguished service to this country has cemented her reputation as a visionary and pathbreaking, bold and principled leader. She's the recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the nation's, uh, the nation's highest civilian honor presented by President Obama in 2012. Secretary Albright is renowned across the world as an advocate for women's education, leadership, and equality. She is also a dedicated Wellesley alumna whose legacy can be seen in the more than 10 years of Albright Fellows who are already shaping our world in so many positive ways. Perhaps one of the most powerful tributes I can share is how often our students name her as their role model and how across decades they say they aspire to follow in her footsteps. Madam Secretary, welcome and welcome home. This afternoon's conversation will be moderated by Carol Giacomo, a prize winning foreign affairs journalist, professor of journalism and current member of the Council on Foreign Relations. From 2007 to 2020, Ms. Giacomo was a member of the New York Times editorial board where she wrote about all major foreign and defense issues, including nuclear weapons, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Her reporting involved regular independent overseas travel, including recent trips to North Korea, Iran, and Myanmar. In that position, she met half a dozen times with President Obama at the White House and has over the years interviewed many American and foreign leaders. As a former diplomatic correspondent for Reuters in Washington, she covered foreign policy for the International Wire Service for more than two decades and traveled over 1 million miles to more than 100 countries with eight secretaries of state. In 2018, she won an award from the American Academy of Diplomacy for Outstanding Diplomatic Commentary. And in 2009, she won the Georgetown University Weintel Prize for Diplomatic Reporting. That's only two amongst many awards. Ms. Giacomo, we are so pleased to have you here with us leading today's discussion. So again, it is a profound honor to welcome Dean Susanna Malcora and Carol Giacomo to Wellesley and to welcome back Secretary Albright for this afternoon's conversation. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Carol Giacomo and our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Johnson. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, before we get started on the meat of the 
matter. I just want to remind you this event is on the record and uh, the format is that I will uh, engage Dean Malcora and Secretary Albright in questions for uh, in a dialogue for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions from you. So please submit your uh, questions in writing via the chat or the Q&A space. Well, I'm sorry we can't be in the same room for this event, I'm still thrilled to be here today for this annual Albright Institute program. In particular, I'm honored to be engaging two women who have each in her own way for years played leadership roles in their countries and on the international stage with the goal of improving not just the lives of people in the United States and Argentina, but around the world as well. When I first started covering foreign policy in uh, Washington years ago, there were no women at the top of America's national security uh, hierarchy. So you can imagine how pathbreaking and how exotic it was when Madeline was appointed Secretary of State by President Clinton. So I have a personal interest in this discussion today because I covered her for all four years that she was secretary and traveled with her on her plane uh, to places far and wide around the world. Uh, having seen the passion, the commitment and drive that Madeline has brought, brought to that job then, it's no surprise that rather than slow down, she's continued to teach, travel, give speeches, write books, manage her consultancy business, chair the National Democratic Institute, and can lead countless foreign policy study groups. Uh, it's really uh, quite exhausting when you think about what she's been up to. I don't know Susanna personally as I do Madeline, but I certainly know her reputation and she too continues to impress with her sense of purpose and dynamism. Women, as we see repeatedly, never give up and they get the job done. And these two women in particular lead very purposeful lives uh, with, and they're involved in practical problem solving. So let's get into this conversation about global leadership and uh, international institutions. I'd ask you both, how, how do you define responsible global leadership? Madeline, you want to start? Well, thank you. And uh, I could spend the whole time thanking everybody and President Johnson and the whole Albright Institute team um, and the fellows and Carol, you for doing this with us and then Susanna, for all the participation that she has had in, in everything and been so helpful and become such a uh, really true friend. Let me just say that uh, I do think that it's very important to think about how to define responsible global leadership. And each three of the words I think are, are very important. Responsible means I think that uh, one needs to consider what the issues really are and understand how they relate to each other uh, and how they really affect people everywhere and that it doesn't do any good to make promises that you can't keep. On the other hand, if you kind of don't have any objectives, uh, then you're not acting responsibly in order to deal with the issues that are out there. The word global is very important. Um, in, in many times, uh, it is considered as a bad word um, that one should, uh, you know, it's kind of like a four letter word that when you want to say it's global. But the bottom line about understanding the word is that it involves also uh, what the position of a particular country is in relationship to others, and that we are dealing with a common humanity, uh, and that it's important to consider how domestic and foreign policy go together. But I do think that it is a word that, and, and we will return to this, I'm sure, uh, is something that is some people admire and some people do not. And the word leadership. Um, I think that the most important aspect about leadership is to listen. Um, and uh, in order to be able to exert leadership, you need to know what the people that you are uh, leading or will lead really want and need. Uh, and so then it circles back to the three words responsible because you are listening to the needs of those that you are working with, global because it does need to have a sense of domestic and foreign, and then the idea of leading can only come if you listen and have 
an approach to what people really need. Susanna? Thank you, Carol. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the Wesley College, uh, President Johnson, for your kind introduction to the Albright Institute. You know, when Madeline called me to say that I, I to propose that I participate in this fellow program, I dive into it immediately. And it is amazing the work that is being done. And I'm thrilled and honored that I have been able to add my little a drop in the great work that is being developed. So thank you, Madeline, for giving me this opportunity. And I, like Madeline, agree that the three words have a standing on their own and that we need to look at them in, 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 in a manner that they are interconnected. And let me start from the end, from leadership, which to me is what really makes the difference. And, and Carol, you referred to Matt Bain as passionate, committed, committed, and having a drive. And I think those three words that I wrote while you were saying them are to me the definition of what leadership is all about. You have to, as a leader, to be humble, recognizing that yes, you lead, but you need to, as Madeline said, listen to the ones you are leading to get a sense of where they are so as you see the vision, you have the vision of the future, you have a connection to them. You have to have the, the, the commitment to hard work. There is nothing given in leadership. There is nothing that falls from the sky. It's working day in and day out that makes you a, a leader. And I will come back to this in a second. And of course, you have to have the drive for results, the drive for impact. What makes a leader a different one is that is conscious of his or her impact and the difference that he or she makes in, in, in the world. So that's the essential piece that nurtures this question about responsible global leadership. The responsibility part and the global part for me are again deeply interconnected. Uh, although as Madeline referred to, there are questions about the global aspect and, and many resent the global aspect. In the end, we are all part of this planet, of this earth, and we cannot renegade from that. There are essential global public goods that affect our lives and our, the way we live affect those essential public, global public goods without any question. So being able to understand the interconnectivity between the locality and the global aspect, being able to establish a virtuous circle between what is that impacts you as a citizen here and what you do as a citizen impacts the world, to me, is part of being a responsible global leader. So I have no doubt that this is a question that is under huge pressure these days, that many distrust this notion. Of course, I'm a globalist, but I'm a globalist recognizing that part of what globalism and globalization has that has impacted negatively the locality of the citizens. So my plea will be that being a responsible global leadership is to redefine what globalization is, finding the, the boundaries, finding the, the constraints of what that globalization approach should have in order not to impact negatively the lives of the people locally. So can we sort of get down to a little bit more granular level? Um, what leaders in what instances do you think have actually demonstrated responsible global leadership? I think I can take, I can take that one first this time. And um, I'm sure we are going to talk about leaders in, names that are probably the same. And let me start from very recent history, which I think is, is something that uh, most likely our audience will recognize. I deeply uh, uh, recognize Angela Merkel as a global leader. Uh, you know, Angela Merkel evolved from the moment she became chancellor of Germany to where she is now about to leave the chancellorship she has evolved 
to strike this balance between her responsibility as a German chancellor, her responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the Germans, and her responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Europe and vis-a-vis -vis the world. I've seen Chancellor Merkel taking very hard decisions, for example, on the question of immigration in, 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 in Europe, which was a very delicate moment where she lost part of her political capital, but she stood by what she believed was the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, and the thing that Europe needed, even though it, her own constituencies didn't recognize that. She worked very, very hard to get the, the Paris Declaration passed through. Many people recognize what the Americans did, which is very, very, very important, what President Obama, the role he played, the role that the French played hosting this. But I have to say, being in the UN at the time, the role that Angela Merkel played behind the scene, bringing into the table people who otherwise were not ready to talk, and doing it quietly, which is another element of leadership. You don't always need to shine. For me, it's an example. And I think that her departure will be a big loss in the current status of the world and, and things that we need to do ahead of us. Evelyn? Well, I would also have named Angela Merkel, but I think what is interesting, and if I, I first met her um, when she was uh, had just become head of her party. And she was very meek and quiet uh, following a, a, ma a major German leader, Kohl. And it was very interesting to be with her because she wasn't quite sure how she, what she was gonna do. I don't know, Susanna, when you first met her, but it was very, very interesting. Uh, and then she was named chancellor and I'll never forget, she came to the United States and the current German ambassador was Wolfgang Ischinger, and they had a dinner at the German embassy, and they said, and now the chancellor. And she walks in, and all of a sudden, she was the chancellor. Uh, and uh, the title began to suit her, but she has really done exactly the kind of things that Susanna uh, has been talking about. And the interesting thing, I was just watching her two nights ago, their C-SPAN was doing the uh, virtual Davos and she was speaking and I thought this woman can't leave the scene. What is she going to do now? Um, and I think that we need to figure out actually because her retirement I think is going to be a major blow to responsible uh, and principled leadership in so many different ways. But otherwise I think it's not easy to find people um, that have been playing that role at the moment fully. Uh, because some of them are restricted in terms of some where they're coming from or whatever. And I think that we are lacking that kind of leadership. Um, and that's why I think it's so important for us to be talking about it. But definitely, I would have named Angela Merkel also. So Karen, let, 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 me, let me add something here, because it's a little example of, of what I find critical in leadership, but it's very unique to female, to women leadership. I've seen Chancellor Merkel in, in meetings, at G20 meetings and other meetings, when things get stuck, quietly, she will get up. She herself, not one of her staff, will go around, will touch the, the shoulder of one of the leaders, I will not mention which ones, just pull him, him because it was always a him, aside, have a persuasive conversation. You could tell, you know, the conversation, the style. They will come back quietly and five, 10, 15 minutes later, this leader will somehow soften his position, change his position, allow for some closer dialogue and finally achieve to a solution. I've seen her doing that and that's leadership. That's something you do not delegate, you do yourself. You pick up the phone like Madeline used to do, call your colleagues and push for the things to happen for impact to take place. That's a really wonderful insight into how a real leader gets the job done. But 
you know, as we've been talking here, analyzing global leadership today, we have been assuming that we're all operating within a specific context, namely a belief in the importance of democracy and leaders committed to advancing freedom, liberty, you know, free and fair election, the rule of law. But as we see, and as Freedom House has documented, we are in fact experience of severe backsliding in democracy around the world and a rise in totalitarianism and authoritarian leaders. Why is that happening and what do we do about it? Um, I'm delighted to uh, try at that. Um, and basically I wrote a book about this called Fascism, A Warning. Uh, which made me have to analyze quite a lot about what was going on. And it makes me go back to um, the, the globalism, global world word. I have often talked about two mega trends and their downside. One mega trend is globalization. And we can spend a lot of time talking about the benefits of that in a number of ways. But the bottom line is it's faceless. Um, and there are a lot of bureaucrats in Brussels and people don't know what they do or um, the UN uh, and people just talk about bureaucrats all the time. But people wanna know what their identity is. And so, and we're all entitled to know what our identity is, you know, where we come from, ethnic, religious. The only problem is if my identity hates your identity, then it becomes nationalism and hyper-nationalism is very dangerous. So what we have been seeing recently are divisions in society. They all have divisions in some form or another, uh, but um, the question is whether you have leaders who bring societies together or those who are set in terms of wanting to exacerbate those divisions. Um, and when I was uh, writing my book, Mussolini was the first fascist um, and he divided society. He identified himself with one group at the expense of another that were then the scapegoats. And so when we look at the list of people that are, uh, you were saying rightfully, there's a, uh, a whole host of uh, countries that have now got more authoritarian leaders um, that are undermining democracy um, and that it is very serious. Um, and that's why I wrote the book. And partially, actually the best quote in that book comes from Mussolini which is that if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, nobody notices. So there's been a lot of feather plucking going on in a number of countries. Things begin in small ways of blaming one group for what is going on um, and saying uh, that um, you're the person that can solve everything. Uh, and that's what we've been seeing. And there has been a growth of that because we have not dealt with the underlying problem of divisions that are created by changes in the economy and technology in a number of different aspects. But that is really, uh, I could analyze all the different authoritarian leaders, but that is the basis of it. Um, it is exacerbating divisions rather than trying to figure out what our common problems are. Susanna. Thank you, Carol. And, and building on what Madeline said, uh, not surprisingly, we, we, we share a, a lot of, of perspectives on this matter. But let me, let me come to it from, from a, a, a little bit of a different angle. And that is the angle of easy answers to complex questions. I think what, what we see here is that it, societies, as um, Madeline rightly pointed out, are a, at points where divisiveness is, is, is there, you know? And a, most of the time, what we see is that there is a loss of identity because of globalization, but also we see a, a growing uncertainty by, by societies because of the speed of change that we are facing. And of course, a, 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 the technological disruption is at the center of this. It's easier to blame globalization than to explain what it, the impact is of, of the technological disruption, you know, and to compare what happens today against the, the industrial revolution and the speed of change and the notion that you don't have a horizon in which you will feel more secure, in which your children will be more secure, the notion that your tomorrow is not going to be better than today. All of those things create 
a, a sense of hopelessness and also a sense of, of, of concern that really is, is there in many parts of society. So one needs to recognize that you cannot negate the existence of that. The problem is when you try to address the, problem, the issues, you cannot simplify them. And that's what leaders that tend to be authoritarian or nationalist do. They give Twitter-sized answers to questions that are very, very difficult, very complex. And to me, that is at the heart of what we are facing today. We, we have people, parts, large parts of society concerned with genuine concerns. To, to address those concerns and find solutions to those problems, you need to portray and lay out very, very sophisticated and complex plans and explain them to, to, to the people. And we are not doing that well enough so the space is taken for those that say, you know, the others are to be blamed by, for the problem. The others are responsible for this. And you create this notion of us versus them within the society or beyond your country and take it to the us versus them between countries. So that is at the heart. And this is something that is happening in many parts of the world, including the US. And we need to address this because unless we address them, we, we, I feel we are at a fork towards the future because at the same time, there are alternative proposals coming from other parts of the world that seem to show that authoritarian regimes can deliver for their citizens and are good options. Mm -hmm. So we need to find ways that our democracy, this, this way of working together, this way of listening to everybody, is efficient and effective enough to deliver to the citizens and to address those challenging questions with answers that mean they, are, they feel better and they are better off. So I agree with what you say about the trends that we're seeing and the stresses on so many societies, but leaders and the people who are raised up by their people to be leaders make choices about how they're going to respond. You know, uh, a, a democratic or leader that we would consider responsible is one that tries to unite people and find common solutions. The, the other kind uh, preys on divisions. And we see a growth in this group we have Putin, we had Trump, we had Orban, we have Bolsonaro, we have Erdogan, we have Xi, we have Duterte to name some of the most prominent. They're all, they all are men. Um, what do you think that says about um, the nature of leadership and, uh, you know, and where we're headed, basically? Well, it, it is tempting to say that a, a women leaders are less inclined to be authoritarian. I, I really hope that to be the case. I also have to say that we don't have enough track record of women leaders, unfortunately, right. to say that in a definite way. I, I think that the, no, the notion of empathy, the notion of understanding the other perspective, the notion of being able to handle a, in, in, in parallel ways multiple tensions that characterize women will tend to prove that women are less likely to become authoritarian. Uh, I just feel that uh, the response to, to the realities that we are facing open the space for, for people, for the peoples to ask for, for a strong hands. You know, it's a, coming, I'm from Argentina, as you, you might hear, hear in, in the introduction that a, a President Johnson made. My country has gone through this exercise many times. And, and we are probably one of the testing grounds of, of, of nationalism, populism. And there are moments when people feel that a firm hand will help solve the problems. I have seen that in society. So we just, the leaders need to be very mindful that that's a, a very a slippery road to take in order to 
gain space in a fast track manner, but that doesn't take you anywhere. At the same time, before you get there, it's clear that you need to address the needs of the people so that they, they don't feel unrepresented, they don't feel misrepresented, they don't feel that their governments don't pay attention to their needs. So there is this two side coin where if we do not deliver to the need of the people, the livelihood that there will be in satisfaction and the livelihood that sometime later on, there will be a call for a strong hand that makes a difference in their lives, that vicious circle is likely to happen. So for me, as leaders, what we need to request, what we need to do is listen to what the people need and work on that, as complex as this might look. And if we are not able to deliver, we need to explain clearly. Of course, we are caught in, in, in a situation where every two years in democracies, politicians are tested. And that's part of the conundrum we need to solve, how to establish longer term perspectives to address the deep root problems that we have, and at the same time, be ready for the two yearly tests that we go through elections. And that tension is part of what we need to solve to live in democracies. Now, I do think that one of the th issues here that one has to talk about is really the basis of governance um, and go for from the various political philosophy courses we all took. You know, people gave up some of their rights uh, in order to have governments that function. And there it's a social contract, frankly, that people gave up some rights to the state so that the state would protect them. Uh, would help to solve the larger problems. And at the same time, the uh, citizens have a responsibility to vote and think and how this goes together. Democracy is incredibly hard. There's no question about it. Uh, some of it has to do with the rapidity of uh, change and um, the, the structures that are there. Um, and it's very interesting because I'm a refugee. We came to the United States after Czechoslovakia was taken over by communists and my father went to teach and he said uh, that he was loved being in America, but he was concerned that Americans didn't understand fragility of democracy enough, but at the same time, the resiliency of democracy. And that's the aspect that I think we need to understand that it doesn't necessarily, you don't have to turn to a leader that can solve everything but democracy itself has to deliver because people want to vote and eat. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there has to be that combination. I also think that what is important and as um, uh, uh, Paula Johnson mentioned, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. And one of the things that we've been doing is encouraging women to run for office uh, because I do think there are certain characteristics that make women good leaders. I also think that men and women working together uh, on democracy is important, but we have to understand, and we've just seen it in the United States, the fragility of it um, and the responsibilities that are there. And it is just easier to turn to Eva Perón or something. Um, and what you really need are people um, to understand that democracy, I mean, these are all cliches, but they're true is a journey all the time and that it requires the input and making sure that that social contract is being fulfilled from both sides. Do you think that, uh, just to follow up on that point, do you think there needs to be some kind of recommitment to democracy? Do, do the democracies, the Western democracies in particular, um, have to uh, somehow have a, a, a renewal? Uh, President Biden apparently is thinking about calling for a summit of democracies uh, in the next few months. Is that a vehicle for for this form of government uh, to somehow renew itself? Well, let me just say from my own perspective, I, I really do think, and it's something that we tried when um, we were in office specifically, I established something called the community of democracies. Um, and we went and had the meeting in Warsaw because the foreign minister at that time, Goremek, 
said he wanted the adjective Warsaw uh, to have uh, be attached to something other than pact, uh, which was the military alliance of the satellite countries. Um, and so the hard part, frankly, was trying to figure out whom to invite. Um, you know, do you invite partial democracy, et cetera? Um, but uh, we had, and the point of it was to try to share best practices. I think that is something important. I do think uh, the Biden people are serious about it. Um, I think that it wouldn't, it, it needs to be something where you don't all of a sudden call 190 countries together um, or whatever number there is. Well, we know what's in the UN, but in terms of that you would define as democracies. But I do think that having support is an important part and learning about what can be done right and um, the various compromises that have to be made. Um, but, and one of the things that I really do like about what President Biden and Vice President Biden have been saying that uh, we wanna see the United States, the power of our example rather than the example of our power. But one of the things as chairman of NDI, I have to tell you we were in Egypt and um, this was after Tahrir Square and I was talking to a, somebody that had been in the parliament. And I said, what you have to do is compromise and build coalitions. And he said, you mean like you guys? So we have not been a very good example recently mm -hmm. and therefore sharing best practices I think is worth and listening to other democracies. Mm -hmm. Susanna, did you wanna jump in there? Well, yeah, and I, I will pick up on, on what Madeline just, just said. I, I think that a building coalition of, of, of countries that practice democracy, that believe in democracy is very important. I think those coalitions need to be a, a wide in geographic representation. They cannot be only Western coalitions because that's not what we need. What we need a world moving to these principles and values, but they have to be built in a very humble way with a humble approach. I think that after what has happened recently in the US, many outside the US question uh, whether this is something that just passed and will not happen again. Some wonder whether this division in half that you see in the US will bring back some, something in two years time or in four years time that will be again going backwards. So there is a instability inherent to this moment that needs to be recognized. I, I think that sharing good practices, best practices, admitting that different countries are at different levels of development of their own democracies is also very important. But constructing around the notion that democracy is, is a compact, is a contract between their, the citizens and the governments that both sides have committed, but there has to be a capacity to deliver is to, for me essential. It's not only the principles, which are absolutely a, 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 a go, no go, but also the capacity to get things done to deliver that makes a difference. So for me, trying to find those best practices, trying to find how you navigate the times of fake news of not recognizing truth as a principle, which is the basis of democracy, is, is essential. And doing it from a humble perspective is, is a prerequisite. You know, I think both of you have sort of touched on this, but let me ask this question in a more direct way. Um, I know both of you believe that America's leadership role in the world is crucial. Um, and, and yes, obviously we've got to demonstrate a greater commitment to that now. But what can President Biden do uh, that would most effectively compensate for his predecessor's mistakes and make the United States more credible as, a, as an actor on the world stage uh, going forward? Well, let me say, uh, nothing could have made me prouder than to represent the United States. Um, and it was interesting to see the amount of influence that we could have and how we operated with others. But uh, Susanna mentioned this and, and I think humility is something uh, that needs to go in there. Uh, and, I, and I believe that 
there needs to be a rebuilding of trust and that the United States, by the way, um, President Clinton was the first one to say we were the indispensable nation. I just said it so often that it became identified with me, but there's nothing about the word indispensable that says alone, it's partnerships. And I think that that is what really has to happen is kind of a resurrection of partnership and a renewal of our vows in a number of different ways. And it's not something that can happen very quickly. And there is always this danger. And I think, uh, Susanna, at some point you mentioned that part of it is also uh, what could happen if there's a different administration again. How do you get other countries to trust you when all of a sudden in the last four years we came up with this in uh, really, uh, I don't even know what words to use that are polite, um, aspect where uh, we uh, really just uh, uh, badgered our partners and, and uh, talked about America first and all kinds of things that was insulting to everybody. And people are concerned. And some of it does go back to some of the things we're seeing as we speak, which means that there are issues in the United States. And uh, President Biden is going to, I believe, work on his theme of unity and of also understanding the alliances, uh, but it's not gonna be to kind of snap your fingers and think that everything will go back. But I do think I personally can go through my whole history and the history of the world since World War II, the United States presence and action is absolutely vital to the functioning of responsible global leadership. Well, Susanna, I, I, what does Biden have to do? Well, first of all, I, I, I will again agree with the, the Madeleine that the role of, of, the, of the US plays in, 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 in this world is absolutely central. So we need the US back in, at the table. My sense is that President Biden has said already that the US cannot do these things alone, which is a very important recognition and goes back to, again to the point of partnering, you know, bringing people together. No question, no question, there, ha there is a need to rebuild trust. The trust, you know, the US was given for granted, was given in many, in many aspects, you know, the fundamentals were the fundamentals of the US and that was not present for, for years. So we need to rebuild that trust. And I believe that the other thing that is important is that there is a connection between the domestic issues and the international issues that the administration has to handle. So that I have seen President Biden address both aspects in, in, in an intertwined manner, that's very important. Going back to the, the climate agreement, going back to WHO, recognizing that we have to be, that the US needs to play a role in, in, in the World Trade Organization, those things are fundamental. So going back to the institutions, sitting at the table, listening, because the world moved while the US was not there for four years. So you cannot go back and say, we reset to four years ago. The world has changed. And, and, and having, again, that humility to be available, to be there, to, be, to partner with others and to find solutions together, particularly in the, the ones that are the higher stakes like climate change, I think that will reset the tone and will help, help in rebuilding that trust that is so badly needed. Um, Madeline, did you wanna to add to that or? Well, I, I really do think that people need to understand it's not gonna happen overnight. And uh, the question is, this is really the issue is the world did move on while we were going through our uh, issues here and they need to be respected for that in many ways. Um, and the question is the combination of things that we've just said, Angela Merkel has played a huge role in keeping Europe um, not only organized, but also kind of having an identity because we were AWOL. And so uh, Europe has developed much more in the last four years. They don't want to be just ignored, uh, nor do they want to be just uh, to assume that they're the logical partners and we'll do everything together. 
and there are disagreements. So I think there is no going back to status quo ante. Uh, and the question is how the relationship works. The part that's interesting, since we have both sat at international tables representing our countries, when I was, uh, there was no question, the 90s were very different. The Cold War was just over and the United States was in a leading position. And so the question was, how did I behave at the UN? You know, um, I could start the discussion. Well, there's, by the way, I think most people now know that most of the discussions don't take place in that fancy room. They're in a back room where you can really have longer talks. And the question was, did I begin to frame the discussion or did I wait till the end to summarize the discussion? Or what about sometimes just talking in the middle uh, and listening? So one of the things one had to do then was to try to figure out what is the right role for the United States. And that's what statecraft and diplomacy is about. And I knew no this much. We have put in a team now that actually understands that. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna open it up to, to students. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry, the time has gone so quickly and that I'm getting to this at the end. What global institutions are most in need of rebuilding? Why don't you both give me one or two examples and, um, you know, and how you would do that? What, what is most in need of rebuilding? Well, if you list them, I will say all of the above. <laughs> because this is, this is not about a single institution. You know? the, the architecture that has been built after World War II is a complex architecture. It was fostered by many countries, not all the ones who are present there. And it was embraced by many more after time. But I think that the, the reality of the shifting a, a weight of powers that we face, the reality of the disruptions we spoke about, the reality of, of the need to focus on global public goods, and one will say WHO now that we are going through the pandemic, but that's only because we are going now through the pandemic that we refer to that. I will argue that taxes are a central piece of what we need to do collectively to address some of the issues we have vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the technological disruption, and we don't have a home for that. So to, for me, is reassessing the need for a global architecture, which I am convinced we need more than ever before, and defining whether that global architecture requires, for example, everybody to agree on everything which is unlikely to happen when you have 193 member states like you do now in the United Nations, or we should create asymmetric coalitions depending on the issues to really start moving certain issues forward instead of the consensus-based system that we have today that is very good if you have a, a, an overall consensus on collectiveness, but if you want to really put a break to decisions, consensus is the best way to go. So there are structural things that we need to, to work on. And for me, that is approaching the notion of the global, global governance overall and building those coalitions to rebuild institutions that are more, uh, most urgent. I would agree that um, if we look at the institutions, they were mostly created after a mega crisis of World War II. We have just had, or are still in the middle of a mega crisis. And it is, I know the cliche again, not to waste the uh, crisis as an opportunity. And I do think there needs to be restructuring. It is not easy because just getting there, uh, uh, you know, Susanna mentioned voting. One of the problems in the EU, it has to be done by consensus. So somebody who's out of line like Hungary can stop everything. Uh, I was, in the Security Council enough to know the threat of the veto, and yet the United States is the one will never give up the veto um, or others. And so majority, there are all these uh, issues that need to be dealt with, but I do think we need to use the crisis to look at how to restructure a lot of them. Terrific. Um, okay, so now we have questions from three of our fellows. So uh, first we have Abby, 
Abby. Hi. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Uh, thank you Hi. for thank you to both of you for taking the time to speak with us, or all three of you. Uh, my question is related to something that you guys have actually touched on a little bit, but I wanted to ask a little bit more. So I think leadership historically and currently is still gendered very masculine, both in the fact that a lot of the leaders we see are men, although that's starting to change, and but also in the characteristics that we prioritize in strong leadership, like being assertive. And I feel like that hasn't really changed very much. However, in this past hour, you've both touched on the strengths that women can bring into leadership. So my question is, are there any characteristics that are typically attributed to women that you think are like very undervalued and predominant or popular conceptions of what makes a strong leader? Well, you know what I find interesting is the countries that are run by women are the ones that have been able to deal with COVID the best. Uh, you know, starting with New Zealand, Taiwan, Finland, Germany, Denmark, Norway, Iceland. And so what are the characteristics of that that have been undervalued in terms of listening and, and feeling that we have a responsibility to take care of each other and not of ourselves? Uh, and I think that part is very important. The part that I think women are really good at is multitasking. Uh, and therefore, I think we have peripheral vision and can kind of see the larger picture and how things fit together, the, the connection of things. And, I, and also the caring. We, when we were going back about talking about divisions in society, uh, mothers do not uh, try to uh, set one group of their children against another group of the children. So I think we kind of need to see what the characteristics are. The problem is that, adjunct, that this, sometimes the same characteristic that men and women have are described by when a woman talks a lot, uh, you know, she's abrasive. Or when I cared about something like what was happening in ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, uh, the men around the table would definitely say, Madeline, don't be so emotional. Uh, whereas the men would be seen as caring. So the same characteristic is described in a pejorative way. I think that there is no question we have different characteristics. And by the way, I'm very glad that that happens because I like the notion that men and women are different. You know, that's, that's something that I appreciate. It, and that we bring different perspectives. You know, it is critical that we have in the decision-making processes a, a diversity, a diverse representation. And of course, the most basic one is gender. You know, the, 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 the world is cut in half. In fact, we are more than half the world. So the notion of having diversity in the decision-making process really allows for decisions to be taken in a much more holistic manner than when you only have men there. So that's why it is so critical. It's not because it is the right thing to do. It's not because it's just. It's not because we have been left behind. That's all true. But the reason in the end is because this is what is going to make a difference. And I will agree with Madeline. Women par parallelize. We, we think about things in parallel. Uh, we multitask in manners. We bring perspectives in manners that men don't. So that is something that is central. And for me, in this complex world of ours, having that ability to connect things that normally you don't need to explain why, but you connect is, is absolutely key to making a difference and to really moving forward the agenda we have. Terrific, okay. Uh, so Jada uh, has the, is next up. Thank you so much for being here. This is a great conversation, very important. So a huge component of the Albright Institute is group work as each group is created to represent students of all backgrounds, disciplines and strengths. So while working on a macro level with people from all over the globe, in your leadership, leadership positions, what are some key and efficient tools that you discover keeps a team motivated, focused and together when everyone has different perspectives and approaches to a problem? Maybe I take, the, I take that one, you know, I have to handle that from, from the UN, from within the Secretariat. Madeline is sat at the US chair, which gave, him, gave her a little bit of an advantage. I sat at a chair where everybody was bringing a different perspective. And let me say, that was exactly what motivated me. Because in the end, the, when you 
when you think about Tuvalu, and that's one of the cases that we discuss as part of the uh, fellows work, and the needs that Tuvalu has, you need to listen to that in order to understand climate change when you put together an agreement like the one in Paris. So there is, it's fundamental to listen. This requires patience, requires the ability to, when you make, you arrive to your conclusions, make everybody feel that they have been part of those conclusions. They have been touched by those conclusions, even though they may not be mentioned directly. So it's an ability to, to listen first, to think where you want to go, what is it that you want to do, how you get there, how is it more impactful, and you say it in a manner that embraces everybody. Although, although you know for a fact that the, the capacity to move forward will be very pointed, very, very narrow, and will not be able to address every single question. So is that ability, people mainly want to be listened. Not necessarily they want to affect the end result because they know that relatively their issues might not be all waiting the same. So it requires time, it requires patience, it requires work. I go back to the point that leadership is hard work and that is something that I feel very passionate about it and I found is, is very rewarding, very fulfilling, although hard work. I think something that is important, there will always be somebody who disagrees and maybe somebody who is, um, there's no better word to say, obnoxious. Um, and uh, Susanna, you were talking about Angela Merkel getting up and patting somebody on the shoulder. I think it is very bad to embarrass people publicly, um, that you can get more out of somebody that is that you've listened to that feels that um, they still need to keep talking or being uh, difficult is to take them aside and, and try that method that diplomacy is very important, but you can't expect that everybody is going to be a Wellesley fellow, you know, uh, and so, uh, and the kinds of things that you've done and you have to get used to the fact that there are people that want a certain amount of tension, only like to disrupt meetings, but you try to deal with them in the most diplomatic way you can. All righty. Thank you, Jada. And now we have Anna. Hello, Secretary Albright and Ms. Melcora. Uh, my name is Anna, and I was lucky enough to be group mates with both Jada and Abby. So we're very excited to be here. We applied to the Institute back in March, um, which was a bit of a blur since we had just been sent home due to COVID. But I remember that one of the questions asked us to explain why Albright and what we hope to gain from this unique program. And I would like to ask that question to both of you. Uh, for Secretary Albright, what inspired you to establish the Institute specifically at Wellesley? And for Ms. Melcora, uh, what drew you to the Institute to be our distinguished visiting professor this year? Thank you. Well, why Wellesley? Because I loved Wellesley and um, I'm a dedicated alum. And um, I was able to have some conversations early on with some of my friends that you've met about what we could do to kind of uh, repay all the things that had happened at Wellesley for us that we could do. And when Diana Chapman was the president of Wellesley, she was interested in, in what we were doing and thinking about it. And so it was natural to do something um, at Wellesley. The thing that I wanted to do, which has worked out really brilliantly, um, is that it be multidisciplinary. Uh, because for me, for instance, when I was at Wellesley, I was a poli-sci major. I took a lot of history uh, but, you know, when I took biology, all I could figure out was what I was going to do with the rats I was raising and not understanding enough about it. And then um, just not understanding enough about the, the, the way that the various disciplines can work together. So the fact that it's at Wellesley and it's multidisciplinary um, and with a variety of students from different places, uh, I never dreamt that Wellesley would be as diverse and wonderful as it is now. 
And therefore that's even added to all of it. So that was my reasoning behind it. Mine was very simple. Madeline called. <laughs> and when Madeline calls, you say yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's absolutely the case. But beyond that, beyond that, you say yes to Madeline because the way the, the, the projects she brings to you, to your attention, are projects that are worth it. So you don't say yes to her because she was Secretary of State of the United States. You say yes because of the sense of purpose that she brings to the projects that you share with her. So that's what brought me here. Having gone through this exercise, having seen what you have done this year, which is my only window to the project, I can attest to what Madeline has said. There is a, a diverse group of women a, among the fellows who bring perspectives from different angles that are absolutely critical. And I will argue particularly to global affairs, to public policy, to public administration, this blend of hard skill, soft skill, broad understanding is absolutely necessary because we, if we go back to what we discussed about leadership in this day and age with the complexity of the issues at hand, only through a complex lens of people seeing things from different angles, you will be able to get the right answers and not to invent answers because you don't believe in the truth. So that's what brought me here and that's what I learned. Thank you. So now we have some questions from uh, the uh, rest of the audience. And I will begin with a question from Wellesley student, Deborah Banquetta. And she writes, Dean Malcora mentioned that leaders try to give Twitter size answers to very complex uh, questions. Transparency seems to be a vital part of responsible leadership but a majority of the world's citizens are illiterate, poorly educated, gaining information from very biased sources of mis or misinformation in one way or the other, especially within developing countries where authoritarianism is most prevalent. How can responsible leaders go about properly informing their populace with all of these challenges to disseminating information, misinformation and information? Well, thanks for that question. Let me let me start since since I, I prompted the question with my reference to, to, to tweets and Twitter. First, I will disagree with the notion that a authoritarian and populist regimes are only prevalent in the developing world. That is a misconception. You have cases in Europe that are appalling, and this is not the developing world. I will argue that the US has gone through an exercise of authoritarianism and it's not the developing world. So there is a deeper question. It, when you look at the people who believe that the elections in the United States have been robbed, they are not necessarily people who are illiterate. This, that's not necessarily the only reason. In fact, there are people who are far from illiterate that are behind that notion. So my sense is that the first thing we have to do is invest in education. You know, that goes beyond any, any discussion. You know, what we need to invest in education in the world. I think the world has moved in, 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 the, in the ranking of education, but it's far from getting to where we need to be, particularly in the case of girls and women. So that is a must. We need to invest in education. But we also need to invest in explain, in finding ways to explain what is there for you as a citizen, which is not an easy answer that does not reflect truth or reality. And that to me is what a responsible leader has to do. Address the issues at hand and find ways to deliver on those issues, but also explain them in a manner that is truthful, because that's respect for your citizens and that's doing delivering on your side of the social compact. I do think the following thing, I talked about one mega trend, globalization and nationalism. Another one 
is technology. And there are great benefits to technology. And I always like to talk about the Kenyan woman farmer who doesn't have to walk hundreds of miles to pay her bills. She can do it over a mobile phone. But there are downsides to technology. Um, and it's the fact that people don't know where their information is coming from. Uh, for instance, if you think about the Arab Spring and social media that made people go to Terrier Square, uh, they don't know what they were going to do when they got there. And so, the, and so, Carol, this goes to you, the role of information, frankly. Uh, I have, uh, when I'm a real academic, I wrote my dissertation about the role of information in political change in Czechoslovakia during the Prague Spring and then about the solidarity press. And so I think the question, and I'm not trying to be uh, difficult, but I do think that it, this does go to you um, as somebody that has been a major player uh, in the media and continues to be and what your responsibilities are and how you make sure that the people actually get information so that they can't say false news or make up their own facts. And that's the problem at the moment. Let, let well, me add I something can't... here, Carol, let me add something what, what, what uh, Madeline just said. One of the problems is, is that technology has brought a demediation in, 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 in the process of communication. Political parties used to mediate on information most of the time. Now that has disappeared. And not only political parties, but, but even journalists are not mediating any longer because you have these other sources that don't have any editorial control, any editorial oversight that become these sources. So that is at the heart. And in my view, talking about uh, the need to address global issues, this is one global issue that we need to address collectively and we need to find a home within the architecture to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously, this is a very rich topic in and of itself, but I'll just make a couple of points. Um, I would say that the mainstream media has really struggled to, in this recent period to deal with uh, both politicians who who decided that their entire that they would try to reshape reality and and tell only lies, and that was not something we were used to. Um, not as many lies. And, um, and the other part, of course, is the polarization of American media in general, where the profit motive is uh, causing some news organizations to really play to an extreme end of the spectrum, uh, only because they get, you know, uh, clients, watchers, readers, whatever. So uh, this is something that we certainly have to struggle with um, in, in my industry, for sure. Um, okay, we, ha we have a, several more questions. So let me, Martha Goldberg Aronson, 89, is asking about the importance of public and private partnerships partnerships to solve some of the world's biggest problems. What role do you recommend the private sector play to be responsible global leaders? Let me just take that quickly because it is something that I've been agitating about. I have believed for a long time that the private sector needs to be at the table early, not to come in at the end. Um, and the private sector or non-state actors uh, are a combination of some are non-governmental organizations and some are corporations. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that the partnership, public-private partnerships are very important. Take the pandemic. Uh, the government can make decisions about um, some of the scientific aspects and you know who, what what's gonna be closed or not. It doesn't produce the vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the issue was uh, a loss on both sides, frankly. But I do think that generally the private sector has a huge role to play. The problem, and I've witnessed this because I was trying to do something um, when, you know, people remember that President Obama spoke in Cairo and said we needed to have different relationships with Muslim majority countries. Secretary Clinton wanted to enlarge that to have it with, um, to do be able to have private dealings with Muslim majority countries and put me in charge of this. And the problem was 
that putting the public and private sector together is like trying to put two Lego pieces together that don't fit. But the private sector has to be at the table earlier. It has a very important role to play. And that's part, and that's part of what we need to do also regarding the, the, the global multilateral architecture, because there is no space for that to take place. And, and when you address some of the global public goods, in order to solve the issues, in order to finance the solutions, in order to really move forward, you can not only a, a, a secure budgets from governments, you need the whole of the economy moving in a certain direction, like greening the economy. So that's part of the change that needs to take place also vis-a-vis -vis the global architecture, with how to bring to the table early on actors that represent a different perspective but are vital to finding solutions. So Rosemary Goldstein asks, I, and I think this kind of uh, deals in a more targeted way with a lot of the things that you've been saying. Rosemary says, how can you convince your citizens who are against democracy to realize the importance of it? Who wants to go first? Susanna, go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you, I, I live through processes of obscure dictatorship. I was at the university when the last dictatorship in my country took, took over. I saw my colleagues, my friends, my mates disappear. I still don't know today why is it that I'm here and I did not disappear with some of them because I was an active a representative of students in the student body. So I know what it means not to have freedom. I know what it means to live in, in the darkness. It is hard to value what you do have not live through often. So my sense is that we need to speak more clearly about what it means not to be able to live the basic, through the basic attributes of democracy and freedom is, is one of them. But we also need to be careful because as Madeline quoted, and I quote her, said to earlier, people want to vote, but the people also want to eat. So it's not only the notion of the basic freedoms that for me is fundamental, it's also the notion of having the responsibility and the authority to deliver on the basic goods that people have. And that is something that has to be tested in many places. So I will talk about a combination of both factors, you know, rem reminding people of what it means not to have what they have, but at the same time, making sure that you give them what their most, more basic needs are. I think one of the aspects that's very important about democracy is that we respect the views of others, that there is freedom of speech. And one of the things that has bothered me is that, and I think, you know, we've talked about the us versus them. Um, I just wrote an op-ed about the most dangerous words are us and them, um, and that what needs to happen is that we talk to people with whom we disagree, um, not argue or not cancel them out or decide that uh, we don't wanna hear what they have to say um, because then that turns people into enemies automatically. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do. Democracy is work, there's no question about it. It does have the capability of correcting itself, but it's not gonna do that uh, just kind of in a vacuum. It requires the people to think about what the other people, how we can solve problems together. That's the only way I can talk about it. Uh, Carol, maybe just to add to what Madeline said, recognizing the other is the first step. Part of the problem we have is that in society today, we live in echo chambers and we do not recognize the existence of the other. Not to say that we talk to the others, we just don't recognize them. And I think that's the most urgent thing for us to do. I think this will be the last question. Um, 
and I think I know what the answer is, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, Franny Wallace says, um, is democracy sustainable uh, or do you think we need to look at a new model? I definitely think democracy is sustainable, but it is not simple. It is both fragile and resilient, and it requires uh, that social contract to be maintained. And I think that it needs to see that responsibility of both sides of it. Yes, and I can't think of a system, um, any other system, frankly, um, and I certainly don't think an authoritarian or totalitarian um, gives you, it may provide simple answers, but it also creates the divisions that then only give power to the person at the top and not to everybody. Yes, democracy is sustainable, but it doesn't happen on its own. It requires work. I, I definitely believe in democracy. I don't see any other choice. It, is, it might be imperfect, but it's the best one we have, the best option we have. And I think that the sustainability is today a, a challenge by the, the fast changing environment in which we are, the impact of the disruption of technology, of digitalization, of communications, of social media, but that only puts a higher bar to work towards democracy. So that's our duty, that's what we have to do. There is no other choice. This discussion could not have been more substantive and more honest. You both have really left it all on the table and shown to all of us uh, what it means to be real thinkers, real leaders, and we're all in your debt. And I have to say that the questions from everybody were very serious and, and substantive as well. Um, so. Congratulations to you all, really. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, now we'll leave. Carol, thank you so much. And Susanna, I can't thank you enough for your participation in everything that we've done at Wellesley, but all the other things we do together. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you all. Thank you, Madeline. And thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. We hope to see you once again.